Peter Tubin is going insane. At least, that's a possibility he's seriously considering. It's the elf sitting on the edge of his kitchen counter, snug between his Keurig and his microwave that is the reason why he's contemplating his mental well-being. It wears green and white stockings and a pair of red boots that curl up at the toes with little brass bells dangling off the ends of them. Atop its head sits an oversized Phrygian cap, the end of which sags impotently over its right shoulder. It has rosy cheeks, a pair of big blue eyes, a pointy nose, and from ear to ear, it sports a wide, tight-lipped grin. It's not a real elf, mind you. Not in the sense that it's made of flesh and blood. It doesn't move or sing or dance, it doesn't live in the North Pole, and it certainly doesn't build toys for all the good little Gentile boys and girls of the world. No, this elf is 50% wool, 30% polyester, 20% some other synthetic fiber that Peter can't pronounce, and its body is filled with heavy plastic beads that give it weight. Peter had purchased it on a whim only a couple hours earlier after stopping into a discount retail store while on his way back from Poppy's Coffee. He had hoped that it would help sprinkle a little Christmas cheer around his white-walled one-bedroom West Hollywood apartment. Elf on the Shelf. The package had read, your very own Christmas time pal. And so, he brought it home, opened the box, placed the silly looking thing on the edge of his bookshelf, and forced himself to smile. Now, two hours later, the elf is sitting on the kitchen counter. And Peter is sure he hadn't moved it. How had it managed to navigate itself from one end of his place to the other? Had someone broken into his apartment and rearranged his stuff while he was busy eating ice cream and looking at stupid cat gifts on his phone in his bedroom? If so, had this mysterious intruder stolen anything on their way out? As far as Peter could tell, nothing appeared to be missing. As a matter of fact, the only thing that seemed out of place is the little elf grinning vapidly at him from his kitchenette faux granite countertop. Peter snatched the elf by its round, bulbous head, then made his way towards the front door. Loose, creaky floorboards sing nervously beneath his feet, each step accompanied by tragic squeals and squeaks, each step sounding yet another note of some dissonant yuletide carol. There's only one door in and out of his apartment, and it's locked just as he left it. If someone had made it inside that place, then they would have needed to phase through the door to get out. Peter unfastened the lock, cracked the door, and peered outside, but finds no suspects loitering nearby. Not a pilferer or prankster or prowler in sight. He sits the elf on the edge of his coffee table this time, takes a few steps towards the bedroom, and then just to be sure whirls around as fast as he can, only to find the pint-sized imp hasn't budged an inch in the four seconds or so since he positioned it in its new resting place. Of course it hasn't budged. It's an inanimate object, for Christ's sake, and inanimate objects don't just get up and walk across departments when no one's looking. He must have moved the thing himself sometime when his mind was on autopilot. Sure, that makes sense. After all, he's been dealing with a lot as of late. Peter shakes his manic little episode off, then retreats into his bedroom so he can go back to practicing his new favorite hobby of burying his loneliness into a pint of rocky road. This is the first year Peter will not be spending Christmas with his family back home in Mississippi. He'd like to be with them, but he knows he isn't welcome. Not since coming out to his folks during the Thanksgiving dinner. He had prepared himself for a bit of blowback from his staunch, conservative family, but he had not anticipated just how appalled they would be once they learned he preferred the company of men to women. Sure, they may have voted for Trump. But it isn't like they went to church or anything. He figured any difference they had could be talked out. But his mom had cried when she heard the news, and his brother had threatened to pummel him. Then there was his sister, who was so afraid that Peter's gayness might be contagious that she declared he would never be allowed within sneezing distance of his nephew again. Get out and don't come back, his father had shouted. So Peter boarded a flight back to Los Angeles that night and hasn't heard a peep from his family since. 
Not even Nana's bothered to call. If things had gone better, Peter would have told them that he had met the love of his life, a handsome young man named Alan, whom he had spent nearly every day with over the past eight months. Alan was the first man, well, the first anybody, really, that Peter had ever been intimate with. He was educated, well-to-do, and most important of all, he was someone Peter could finally be himself around. Thanksgiving had left him discouraged, but not broken. His family might come around eventually, and if they didn't, at least, at least he still had his boyfriend. But alas, life is cruel, and sometimes a little icy heartache can turn into a blizzard of misery. Peter received a text after his plane had landed in L.A. Alan wanted to see other people. They were moving too fast for his liking, and just under 26, he wanted to explore his options. I'm not ready to give you my heart, was how the message had ended. Every day since has been an exercise in solitude for poor Peter. Now he had no boyfriend, no family, not even a friend to phone. And with Christmas only two days away, he has nobody to spend the holiday with for the first time in his life. Peter wakes up screaming in a dark, starless sky outside his bedroom window, and for a moment, it seems as though the heavens have vanished. The time on his phone reads 3 a.m. He thinks that maybe he should try to sleep, but he isn't eager to return to his nightmares just yet, so he props himself up instead, resting his back against the headboard of his bed. A yawn forces itself from his mouth as he lets his eyes wander around the room, it's here that he notices it, feet dangling off the end of his dresser, gazing at him through a pair of comically large, glassy blue eyes. An arctic chill runs down Peter's spine at the sight of his late-night visitor. It isn't the moaning, chain-clad ghost of Jacob Marley, although at that moment he wishes it was. Peter reaches a trembling hand towards his bedside lamp. In a clumsy panic, he knocks over the pint of rocky road and sticky brown goop dribbles down the end of the table and onto the carpet below. He curses under his breath while he fumbles with the lamp. After what feels like an eternity, he manages to find the switch and a dim yellow glow pours into his bedroom. Peter stares hazy-eyed at the soupy chocolate puddle seeping into his rug, wondering how the hell he was going to get the stain out, but soon remembers the abominable sense of dread that's been stalking through his mind just moments earlier. The ice cream melts quickly from his consciousness, and a reinvigorated terror begins to once again swell inside him. His body shivers. His skin prickles. The abominable dread has returned, but it isn't just stalking anymore. Now it's thrashing about wildly like a white, woolly beast. Peter can't help but feel like he should probably get to running. He chances a glance at the dresser, hoping the shadow has been playing tricks on him. It wouldn't be the first time. All too often, when he was a kid, he'd awake in bed and find himself the victim of, of their puckish late-night hijinks. They'd dance and frolic across the wall, casting grotesque shapes in the darkness. They'd haunt his dreams, they'd rob him of sleep, and on more than one occasion, they'd, their pranks even caused him to soil his sheets. But those naughty shadows are gone now. The lights banished them away, and all that remains is a little elf sitting across the room grinning at him in all its horrible holiday glory. There's no malice behind the painted-on smile that's terrorizing Peter's psyche. There's no anything, really. The elf's face hasn't changed since Peter first removed the thing from its flimsy cardboard packaging. It's still, its grin disturbs him. The very sight of it. It's enough to numb his brain worse than any gas station icy ever could. He wrestles with the reality of what's going on while desperately trying to maintain his grip on sanity. Peter chalked up the first incident to a slip of the mind, but twice now he's found the creepy thing somewhere it had no right to be. He'd set the elf on the coffee table before going to bed. Of this, he's certain. So how the hell is it currently sitting on his dresser? Sleepwalking! 
The idea barrels down on him like an avalanche. Peter once read in a psychology textbook that stress can be a trigger for sleepwalking. And if he remembered correctly, the condition isn't simply resigned to people who wander their homes like brainwashed zombies. During episodes, subjects suffering from the disorder have been documented to open doors, binge on food, even rearrange the furniture in their homes. Could it be possible that the breakup with Alan had sparked an unconscious urge in Peter to deck the halls, even while he dozed? He knows the idea sounds shaky, but what's the alternative? That the elf is wandering around the place on its own whenever he isn't paying attention? He shuddered at the thought. He decided it would be for the best if he stuck to the sleepwalking theory instead. Nonetheless, the fucking elf will have to go. The night is unfriendly at this hour both quiet and cold. There isn't another soul in sight, not even a car rolling down the road in front of Peter's apartment building. By morning, the streets will be bustling with commuters and pedestrians will be crossing at every intersection, but for now, the rest of the world is hiding from him. A frigid wind blows through the air and Peter hugs himself to fight it off. He's walking across the parking lot, elf in hand, was a big black dumpster filled with dirty diapers and old magazines and fruitcakes from Grandma that taste like sawdust. He doesn't like to be outside right now, freezing his ass off in his PJs, but he won't be able to sleep with the elf in his place, so he sucks it up and marches onward. The sooner he gets rid of it, the sooner he can go back to bed. Peter's thoughts drift off to Alan as he hurries across the asphalt. He's wishing they hadn't spent so much time together. Maybe if he had given himself more space, while they were a couple, the breakup wouldn't have been so painful. But he had grown accustomed to falling asleep with his boyfriend's arms around his waist, and gotten used to waking up every morning to his face. Now that Alan was gone, Peter is beginning to realize how difficult adapting to life without him will be. Is Alan having trouble adapting too? Probably not. He hadn't even bothered to check on Peter since he kicked him to the curb, like a dried-up noble fur. When Peter reaches the dumpster, he places the elf down gently on the closest pile of stinky garbage. He studies it curiously, half expecting the plushy little thing to spring to life like Frosty the Snowman, and belt out a rendition of Santa Baby while doing a jig on top of a greasy pizza box. The musical number never comes, though. The elf just sits and grins and stares, and for some time... Peter realizes that no matter how hard his paranoia might be, might be trying to will the absurd spectacle into reality. A singing, dancing doll is one Christmas miracle that simply isn't going to happen. Relieved by this sudden moment of clarity, he closes the dumpster's lid and seals the elf away inside its trashy tomb. When he returns to bed, he sees the notification light on his phone is blinking. Someone's texted him but he can't think of anyone who might be up at this time of night. Maybe the elf has sent the message from some discarded phone found in the dumpster. Don't leave me here. Baby, it's cold outside. He laughs the notion off, but before his giggle even trills away, a second idea trickles into mind. Peter used to receive late-night texts from Alan on those rare evenings when they weren't together. The texts almost always turned into sexual conversations, and almost always ended up with Peter driving over to Alan's place for a little nocturnal necking. Is Alan looking for a booty call? Peter wondered what he'll do if this turns out to be the case. Part of him wanted to lash out in disgust at the idea of being used for sex, but part of him burns desperately to have his old flame touch his body once more. Sure. It might be degrading, but it would be nice to feel needed, if only for one night. Peter opened his phone, head buzzing with possibilities, unsure of how he might respond to Alan's request, but once he sees the text, his excitement dwindles down to nothingness, and his heart shatters inside his chest like a cheap glass ornament. This is your service provider. You have 10% more data left on your phone. If you go over, you will be charged. Even cities the size of Los Angeles slow down on Christmas Eve. I mean, there's still traffic, of course. 
but Peter's commute to the gym takes nearly half the usual time. And when he gets there, he finds that aside from a few generic gym rats and a handful of people who made it to spin class that day, he has his run of the place. He doesn't want to be there, but he doesn't think that sitting at home by himself is a healthy way to deal with his self-diagnosed depression. So he forces himself through the motions, pushing up dumbbells, pulling down levers, running in place like a hamster on a wheel. He checks his phone throughout the workout, hoping that someone will acknowledge his existence. He isn't expecting much. Merry Christmas, or thinking of you, would be all the words of affirmation he needed to get him through the day, but, but much to his dismay, nobody bothers to text. Not Mother, not Nana, certainly not Alan. And by the time he finishes his last exercise, he finds himself wishing he had passed the time that morning watching movies in bed. He cries in the shower at the gym. It's the first time that he's been able to since the breakup, and once the waterworks start, there's no turning them off. Snot bubbles from his nose. His body shakes with despair. Tears cascade down his cheeks as hopeless sobs and groans burst free from his throat. He knows everyone in the locker room can hear him, but he's moving beyond the point of caring. Viscous sorrow has been swelling inside him for weeks, and now that it's finally spilling out, the naked old men within earshot of his woeful wails were the least of his concerns. Nobody makes eye contact with Peter after he towels himself off and heads to his locker. He's had enough of society today and wants nothing more than to be at home right now. His plan is to go back to his place just as soon as he gets dressed and spend the rest of the day eating ice cream on the couch. Peter's tears may have run dry, but he knows that they'll come again. At least the next time his body decides to flush out all this excess grief, it can happen in the privacy of his own apartment. Peter opens his locker and reaches for his gym bag. He steps into his briefs and slides them up over his rear, but before he can move on to his jeans, his muscles tense and his body freezes with fear. He stands petrified in his underwear, unable to move, staring helplessly at the cracks in the locker room's tiled floor. Something hadn't been right about his locker and his mind is only just starting to catch up to this fact. Nothing's missing from it. Even a cursory glance had been enough to tell Peter that all his clothes and belongings are present and accounted for. No, the problem is that he thinks he might have seen something else in addition to his stuff that had been in his locker when he started his workout. He takes a long, hard swallow as he gathers the courage to look again. There's no way that he had seen what he thinks he saw. That would be impossible. Perhaps what had shocked him so suddenly had been an old stick of deodorant. One that he hadn't noticed the first time that he had opened his locker. Or maybe he hadn't even seen anything at all. His paranoia had been working overtime since last night. A million other possibilities ran through his head, but somewhere in the back of his mind he knew. None of them are true. What he had seen in his locker could not be mistaken for anything else. Deodorant doesn't dangle its legs off of shelves. It doesn't wear green and white stockings. It doesn't have a pointy nose or big blue eyes. And it certainly doesn't smile at you like tiny taxidermied Satan. Peter finally managed the nerve to break his paralysis long enough to lift his gaze back up to the shelf. The elf is back. There's no way to explain its presence this time. Peter knows it has no good reason to be there. Either someone's playing a hideous joke on him, or the freaky little thing is actually cursed. The latter beginning to sound more probable by the second. But it's not like he bought the elf from some Christmas town antique shop run by an ancient relic of a man puffing on a pipe while mumbling cryptic warnings. The place he picked it up from was a franchised retail store, no more than two blocks from his apartment. One that sold brand clothes at bargain prices and home decor that's almost always damaged. He had purchased a couple socks from the same store, and to his knowledge, they'd yet to demonstrate the ability to teleport around wherever they pleased. The elf isn't helping his mental health. He won't be able to find an ounce of peace until it's out of his hair for good. But chucking it in the trash again is obviously out of the question. He could try burning it down to a pile of ashes, but... He doesn't think the owner of this gym would appreciate him starting a small fire in the locker room, and he doesn't want to get arrested for arson. 
His best bet is to take it somewhere far away and leave it in a place where he could be confident that it won't come back. He racked his brain trying to think of where that place might be. It isn't long before an idea comes to him, and once it does, his eyes light up brighter than the Griswold house on Christmas. The Santa Monica Pier is a charming tourist trap featured regularly on television and movies. Visit any of the 300 identical souvenir shops in the area, and you can pick up a wonderful shiny postcard displaying an image of the pier's famous Ferris wheel tower overing a bouquet of tattered, washed-out vendor umbrellas like a lone sunflower standing amongst meadows of wilting poppies. Walk along its famous boardwalk and you'll find a myriad of family restaurants selling cut-rate processed seafood an arcade gallery with broken down game machines, and tomorrow's music stars performing their latest hits in front of adoring crowns of four or five. Peter is standing at the far end of the pier now, staring out across the vast openness that is the Pacific Ocean. He takes it in a deep breath and can taste the salty tang of seaweed in the air. From his apartment, about 13 miles inland, a layer of car exhaust looms over the city like a hazy yellow ghost, but here, on the coast, the sky is clear and blue. In Peter's hand is a canvas-wrapped bag. In the bag is the elf and six or seven good-sized rocks that he lifted from someone's drought-resistant front yard. He had not come to the pier to admire the fresh air or marvel at the Ferris wheel. He had done that all before. His plan is to drop the bag into the sea, and let the elf sink down to the ocean floor. If he had a boat, he might have sailed all the way out to the open waters to dump the thing. But the water around the pier is plenty deep, and he thinks it would be enough to accomplish his task. A dozen feet to his right sit two old men on a bench. One is heavy set with a mustache and salt and pepper hair. The other is thinner, clean shaven, with walnut framed glasses and big white teeth that offer a strange contrast to his leathery, sun-beaten face. Their fishing poles lean precariously against the railing, the lines of which run down the edge of the wooden deck, disappearing into the ocean below. The old men pass a flask back and forth, paying little attention to their poles while gazing absent-mindedly out to sea. Peter checks the bag one more time, just to be sure the elf hasn't pulled a Houdini and made a miraculous escape. To his relief, he finds it still right where he left it, both buried amongst a pile of smooth, polished stones and gawking up at him through its enormous, empty eyes. Peter looks into its face, and as he does this, he reminisces about Alan again. He's decided that he's not just drowning the elf today, but the love he once had for his ex-boyfriend as well. He doesn't want to lie awake at night wondering if Alan is missing him anymore. He... He wants to build scar tissue around his wounded heart. He wants, wants it to become calloused and tough so no one will be able to harm it again. Peter secures the sack shut with a double knot, then flings it over his shoulder like St. Nick. He pauses for a moment and glances back at the old men to see if they might be watching, realizing they're paying even less attention to him than their fishing poles. He flings the bag off the pier. It lands in the murky blue water with an anticlimactic bloop, then sinks down, 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 disappearing into the sea. For a long time, he stares at the water below, watching a brown rope of seaweed snake itself between the pier's great wooden pillars, not, not because he expects the elf to come bobbing back up to the surface, but because... The whole ordeal has left him drained. Parting with the elf was easy, but drowning his feelings for Alan has taken more energy than he anticipated. He wants to dive into the water like a lifeguard and rescue these feelings before they're gone forever, but he knows they must stay buried in the muck at the ocean's floor, where they belong. Letting them breathe again might reopen the wound in his heart, and Peter understands he's only just begun to heal. Besides, Things will get easier once July rolls around and everyone stops talking about love and togetherness. In the new year, he'll focus on himself. 
and start fresh. He might even try keto, take up a new hobby. All he has to do now is figure out how to make it through Christmas. When Peter turns to leave, he catches a glimpse of the old man again and notices for the first time that they're holding hands. The mustached man takes a pull from his flask and passes it to his partner, who flashes then flashes his big white dentures before kissing him on the cheek. After he takes a sip, he rests his head on the mustached man's shoulder, and as he does this, Alan's face flashes to the forefront of Peter's mind. It appears that love may be more buoyant than Peter had hoped. He attempts to flood his head with other thoughts in a desperate attempt to keep it submerged, but to no avail. The persistent. But he's not giving up yet. If his feelings won't stay buried at sea, then there's always other ways to drown them out. It's getting late and Peter hasn't been home yet. After leaving the pier, he stopped off for a drink, and now, eight Manhattans later, he's feeling pretty buzzed. He's sitting by himself in a dimly lit hovel of a bar. The phosphorescent glow of neon bar signs bleed across the walls, and tacky silver tinsel dangles carelessly from the ceiling. In the center of the room, a man and woman around Peter's age hold each other tight. Shifting slowly from side to side while the voice of Elvis Presley moans a lonely blue tune over the jukebox speakers. They're wearing matching red sweaters flecked with heart-shaped snowflakes. As they sway, rhythm and inhibitions dulled by booze, the lovers allow their hands to explore each other's bodies, fondling and squeezing with zero concern for public decorum. Peter watches them from his shadowy corner. He envies how how effortlessly they display their love, and he hates them for it. Just a few weeks ago, he thought that he had something like that with Alan. But now he knows it wasn't real. There are a few others in the bar, but he's the only one drinking solo. It seems that everyone in the world has someone to spend the holidays with, aside from him. He tries to get up, stumbles back onto his stool, stands up successfully on his second attempt, and flags down the bartender. He's had enough to drink. With any luck, the cocktails will have him sleeping through the morning, and if that doesn't work, he has some pills in his medicine cabinet that should do the trick. A bartender wearing a striped tie adorned with happy, prancing reindeer brings the tab over. Peter hands him his credit card without looking at the bill, then returns his focus to the two turtle doves feeling each other up on the dance floor. His attention only broken when he feels the buzz of his phone in his pocket. Peter pulls it free from his jeans, glances at the screen, and notices he's received a text. His heart beginning to beat inside his chest like a war drum at the sight of it. The message is from Alan. Alan is texting him. Now? After weeks of completely ignoring his existence? He's not ready for this, especially not after eight cocktails. Against his better judgment, Peter opens up the message and reads it. It's short, but to the point. This is what it said. You up? Before Peter even had the chance to respond, two more texts from Alan came through his phone. The first is a picture, but the service in the bar is shoddy at best, and the image gets stuck in loading purgatory. A little wheel spins endlessly inside an empty gray box, letting Peter know that the pic will be available for viewing whenever his phone decides it's good and ready. He doesn't need to see the picture to know what it will be, though. A sexy selfie. Back when they were together, Alan had the habit of sending him naughty pics whenever he was fishing for company. After reading the next message, his suspicions were all but confirmed. Come sit by the tree with me. Peter watches the loading wheel as it continues to spin inside the empty gray window on his phone screen and feels his blood begin to boil. The man who so easily tossed him aside just a few weeks ago is trying to use him for sex on Christmas Eve. Is that all he is to him? Some cheap holiday blow-up doll? If Alan had texted him last night, Peter might have been too weak to say no, but now, now he feels only revulsion at the thought of his ex's proposition. 
He's made up his inebriated mind. There'll be no hooking up as far as Peter is concerned. He knows he shouldn't text back, but he's too angry to help himself. I'm sure the alcohol might be fueling his rage, but hell, it feels good to give in to his feelings. And at least he isn't crying in a locker room full of shriveled old men dicks this time. He taps furiously at his keys. You ripped out my heart. I hope the same happens to you. Just as soon as he pushes send, the bartender returns with his credit card. Peter signs the bill, tips him generously, and snags his phone off the bar. His blood returns to lukewarm, and a sense of pride is now rushing through him. He's glad he didn't allow himself to be taken advantage of, but he worries that he might one day fall back into his ex's arms during a moment of weakness. Better to nip it in the bud and block Alan from contacting him so the situation doesn't get the chance to arise. He opens the chat box back up and is about to block Alan's number when the picture that's been sent to him finally loads onto his phone. Peter's blood is changing temperature again. But it isn't getting hot this time. It's starting to feel as if antifreeze has been injected into his vein. The silent terror falls upon him as he stares breathlessly into the picture. It isn't the fact that Alan's lying suggestively on the couch, wearing nothing but a pair of tight red briefs that made Peter's blood run cold. It isn't his icy blue stare or his chiseled physique either. In fact, there's nothing about Alan in the picture that Peter finds unsettling at all. It's what's perched behind Alan on the picture that's sending shivers through his body. A small, plushy elf that looks exactly like the one Peter threw into the ocean is sitting on his ex-boyfriend's throw pillow. Maybe it isn't his elf, he thinks. Maybe Alan had picked one up for himself at one point. It's Christmas Eve, after all, and every December those things pop up all over the retail stores across the country, like a rash of holiday herpes sores. His elf should still be sitting at the bottom of the Pacific right now. There's no way it could have somehow gotten to Alan's place from there. Peter looks more carefully at the picture this time. And sees that there's something beside the elf that's draped over the back of the couch. Something snake-like, greenish-brown in color. He places his index finger and thumb on the image, then expands it in order to get a closer look. And after he does this, he has to put a hand over his mouth in order to stifle a scream. It's seaweed. It's been Christmas morning for 17 minutes by the time Peter pulls up to his ex-boyfriend's house. Alan's BMW is parked in the driveway and the lights are on in his home. From the street, nothing looks amiss, but Peter has a terrible feeling that something wicked might be happening inside the house at this very moment. From the second he first saw the elf on the kitchen counter, he's been trying to convince himself that depression and loneliness has been fueling his paranoia. But now he's not so sure. The fact that Alan hasn't picked up a single call or answered any of his texts has only intensified his unease. He sinks low in his seat and peers out his car, hoping to catch a glimpse of his ex through the window of his house. Any sign that could indicate that he's all right could put Peter's mind at rest. He can figure out how to cope with delusional fantasies, but he doesn't think he'd be able to handle it if what he fears is actually true. Peter buries his head in his hands until the world stops spinning. Why doesn't he just call an Uber and go home? Why, why should he care if Alan's in trouble? The guy's a jerk anyway. He asks himself these questions and others in a desperate attempt to excuse himself from the situation, but deep down he knows why he's there. It's the reason why he so recklessly risked a DUI or, or worse when he got inside his car and drove out to the valley as fast as he could when he saw the picture. Even though he hates Alan for dumping him, and even though he has been attempting all day to drown his feelings for him in whiskey and seawater, a part of him still loves the man. He doesn't think he could forgive himself if he let anything happen to him. He tries to wait and step out of his car on wobbly legs. The alcohol has hit him harder since he left the bar. And if he didn't have so much adrenaline pumping through him during the drive out, he probably would have passed out at the wheel. 
His body swerves to and fro across the cobblestone path leading up to the house. And by the time he gets to the door, his stomach begins to lurch. He kneels over and gets ready to heave in the bushes, but the only thing that comes up is a deep, bellowing burp. And he's suddenly reminded of the clam chowder that he had for lunch. Peter straightens himself up, takes a deep breath, then rings the doorbell. He made a little prayer into the air that Alan will answer the door and everything will be all right. Maybe if Peter's lucky, he'll even offer him a couch to crash on so he doesn't need to catch a ride home. But lots of prayers go out on Christmas, and God just doesn't have time to answer them all. Peter's request seems to have landed in a divine backlog file, because after a few minutes of swaying back and forth on the front doorstep, it becomes evident that Alan isn't coming. He tries the doorknob locked, but Peter knows there's a key and a fake rock hiding somewhere in the bushes, and it doesn't take long before he's able to locate it and let himself in. He leans up against the wall in Alan's foyer. It's weird being back. When they were together, this place felt like a second home. Hell, maybe even a first one. He had spent more time at his boyfriend's place than, than at his since they started dating. Now he can't help but feel like an intruder. Everything's still the same way he remembered it. The same pictures hanging from the walls. The same glass chandelier is still suspended from the ceiling, but, but the sense of welcoming and hominess is gone. It stings a little. The house isn't very big. A typical one-story Burbank bungalow on a tiny little lot in the middle of a residential neighborhood. The living room where Alan sent the pick from is just through a door on the other side of the foyer. The house is well lit, but aside from that... There doesn't seem to be any signs of life. There's no music. It doesn't sound like anyone's watching TV in the living room. Peter calls out Alan's name, but no one answers. He calls out again, this time loud enough for his voice to carry through every room. But again, it's met with only silence. He crosses the foyer and almost falls flat on his face before catching himself against the wall on the other side of the room. Peter kneels over fights off the urge to puke again, then forgets all about his nausea when he catches a glimpse of the living room. The scene looks almost like a picture you'd see on the cover of a holiday issue of some trendy interior design magazine. The walls are painted a lilac gray, which gives the room a fashionable yet cozy ambiance, and in front of the black leather couch sits a modern coffee table that Peter knows Alan had paid a mint for. A beautiful Christmas tree draped with gold ribbons and expensive crystal ornaments, stands tall in the corner next to a floor-to-ceiling window that looks out to the backyard. And the fire crackling in the fireplace really helps to hammer home the Christmas time motif. There's only one thing out of place, but, but it would easily disqualify the room from receiving a feature in Country Living or Better Homes and Garden, or any of the other home design magazines that Peter reads, when he's... while he's on the toilet. Just beneath the fireplace, sprawled out across the floor, face up, in a deep, red pool of blood, is Alan's corpse. Either Peter blacked out after seeing Alan's body or time skipped a beat because the next thing he knows, he's on the other side of the room, bawling his eyes out and cradling his ex-lover's head in his lap. He's sitting in the scarlet puddle now and there's no way the stains are going to come out of his favorite jeans in the wash, but Peter doesn't care. What's a little blood compared to what Alan's gone through? His former lover has been horribly maimed, his chest split in two, pried apart with the fireplace tool scattered across the floor. From a look of abject horror on Alan's face, he was alive as his body was being torn apart. Ribs had been broken, his internal organs visible through the massive gaping cavity that was once a chest. Well, not all of his internal organs. But Peter wipes the tears from his eyes, smearing blood across his face and sees that something is missing. He glances up to the couch, and it's here that he sees the elf staring at him from the throw pillow. Still as silent and as statuesque as ever, still grinning its horrible little grin. Something appears to be resting in its lap. 
about the size of a fist and as red as the hat in Chris Kringle's head. He remembers the text that he sent to the bar earlier that night. You ripped out my heart. I hope the same happens to you. I didn't ask for this, he screamed. Peter grabs the fireplace shovel, one of the instruments that had been used to open up Alan's chest, and shoots it to his feet. He storms across the room, all the while hurling enough curse words of the elf to land himself in Santa's naughty list for the next ten years. Once he's a few feet from it, he grits his teeth and raises the shovel over his head. You did this! Why couldn't you just leave me alone? Peter brings the shovel down as hard as he can. For sure, he thinks this will be the moment where the elf springs to life before his eyes, just in time to dodge the blow and dance around the room, laughing like a maniacal little demon that it truly is. Or maybe it'll snatch the shovel away at the last second and use it on him, like a can opener, the same way that he did on Alan. Whatever it does, now's the time it shows its hand, right? Now's the time the little bastard proves it's more supernatural hell spawn than superstore novelty knickknack. But the elf doesn't move. It just smiles and it takes its beating. And even after the shovel collides with its plushy little body for the 27th time and stuffing is popping through its seams, the elf doesn't even bother to blink an eye. Peter drops the shovel and looks at his work. Some of the plastic beads that make up the elf's beanbag body have scattered onto the floor and one of its arms is dangling precariously by a thread. Alan's heart, which has been sitting on the elf's lap, has become an unfortunate bystander during Peter's onslaught and is now mushed across the couch's cushions. Peter had given the elf everything he had during his moment of rage. That many blows from the heavy iron shovel would have been enough to shatter a human skull into nothing but paste, yet somehow, as he stares at what he's done, he feels like his work is unfinished. He snatches the elf off the couch and squeezes it in his hand so hard his veins begin to bulge in his forearms. He isn't done with it yet. If he leaves, the son of a bitch will just come back and he'll follow him until his dying days. He's sure of it. His eyes trail over to Alan's corpse on the floor. It looks like as if a xenomorph had been nesting inside of his chest. In the stone hearth beneath him, the fire is still burning strong and Peter now knows what he's going to do. He races across the room, rears his arm back and hurls... His Christmas time pal into the flames. The elf doesn't scream as the fire engulfs it. It doesn't curse him in a demonic voice or flail in agony. It doesn't do anything really other than blacken and burn and warp in a misshapen mass, but Peter finds satisfactory in this anyway. Come back from that, he thinks to himself. The world begins to spin around him, so he sits down on the couch and sucks in a deep breath. In all the excitement, he had forgotten that he was pissed drunk. But before he has a chance to stand up again, a voice fills the room. Hello? Sir? For a second, he thinks he might be coming from the elf. When he looks back to the fireplace, he sees what's left of it still swaddled in the flames. And I... No, it can't be the elf. Besides, this voice is too masculine and tinny. Sounds like it's coming from, from inside the couch. Sir, are you still there? He roots around in the seat cushions for a few seconds before he finds the source. Alan's phone had been buried beneath the couch pillows, and it appears to be in the middle of a call. Peter holds the phone to his ear but doesn't respond. Sir, if you can't talk, just remain calm. We've already dispatched the police. They should be arriving at your home shortly. His mind starts to race as he takes in his surroundings. He looks at the beautiful Christmas tree and the modern coffee table and the body of his former lover lying mutilated on the living room floor. In the reflection of the window, he sees himself. His clothes are filthy. His shirt, more stained, more bloody than John McClane's at the end of Die Hard. How was he supposed to explain this to the police? His clothes are covered in Alan's DNA, and the real murderer is burning up in the fireplace. Does he have time to make a run for it? On the way over, he promised himself that he'd never drive drunk again, but in this case, he might make an exception. He doesn't get the chance to break that promise, though, because by the time he gets to the front door, two squad cars are already parked in the driveway. Their blue and red lights pulsate in the darkness like a rave scene. 
When the cops step out of their vehicles and shine their flashlights on him, Peter drops to his knees in the doorway. It wasn't me! He screamed. It was the elf! It was the goddamn elf, I swear! It's early Christmas morning. One year after Peter was arrested for the murder of his ex-boyfriend, Alan. Dawn hasn't broken yet and the sky is still slate black. Peter is lying in bed and gazing into the darkness through the single window of his cell. He is closing out the first of what is to be a 40-year prison sentence. The guilty verdict wasn't a difficult one for the jury to make. Not after all the evidence that had been present in court. The murder weapon had Peter's fingerprints all over it. Peter had the victim's blood all over him. And of course, there was that little matter of the threatening text message, which basically served as a confession to the crime. You ripped out my heart. I hope the same happens to you. Open and shut case. Peter's family never bothered to come to the trial. They might believe the murder was a result of some sort of satanic homosexual practice that Peter had picked up from a Hollywood sadist cult. Even after his arrest, they didn't bother to pick up any of his calls. But he's okay with that now. In fact, he hasn't tried phoning them in months, and he thinks that he's found a peace with the fact that he'll never hear from them again. He's found peace with a lot of things as of late. His prison psychiatrist had been helping him get over the underlying issues that had been plaguing him just one year ago. He doesn't wallow in loneliness anymore. He has his own cell. That solitude doesn't even bother him. Now he welcomes the peace it comes with. He's gotten into reading, his little book of Sudoku that keeps his thoughts occupied when he doesn't want to dive into a world of fantasy. He's still working with a psychiatrist to get over his feelings about the elf, though. She's been trying to help him realize that what he experienced last Christmas wasn't real. A stress-induced hallucination is what she described the episode. Whenever she tells him this, Peter nods and smiles and agrees with whatever she says. And maybe even a part of him would like to believe that she's right. But somewhere, deep down, he feels like that's not the case. There's no way he could be a murderer. He isn't even capable of harming a fly. And Alan was the last person on earth he would wish to harm. But a year has passed and the elf is still just a memory. So, so maybe he thinks that she's on to something. Maybe the fire did away with a little bastard. Or maybe it's just the antipsychotics. Either way, it doesn't matter. He just has to work on being happy with what he's got. At least the guards aren't jerks to him. None of the inmates have tried to mess with him yet. He even heard whispers that he's developed a reputation around the prison after word got out about the nature of his crime. He chuckles to himself. Big, bad Peter. Toughest guy in the yard. The bit of pressure that's been building in Peter's bladder has started to get uncomfortable, so he figures he might as well start Christmas off with a good morning piss. He swings his feet over the edge of his bed, sits up, rubs the sleep from his eyes. One of the best parts about having his own cell is not having to share a toilet with anyone. He looks over to the chrome commode in the corner of his cell, and, and it's here that he sees it. Sitting on the edge of the rim, black, charred, twisted and deformed, but still grinning its wicked grin and staring at him through a pair of melty blue eyes. Peter screams so loud it wakes every inmate in the cell block. He fights the guards when they arrive and it takes four grown men to hold him down long enough to inject him with a sedative. One final horrifying thought lights up his synapses just before his muscles go slack and his vision fades to black. The elf is back. Hey there, kids. Thank you so much for listening to tonight's story. And I wanted to tell you, thank you, you know, for listening to me at all. I am actually coming up on doing this for 10 whole years. Come January 4th, I will have been doing YouTube for 10 years. 
So that's a hell of a thing, man. And honestly, it, it means nothing without all of you. So thank you for that. Thank you for listening on YouTube or on the podcast. I also want to give a very big thank you shout out to all of you guys out there on Patreon. If you guys want to check out patreon.com slash Creepypasta, you're able to support the show, uh, support me, support my cats, support, you know, uh, being being cool folks out there like people like these. Jordan Alexander Sanchez, Mr. Thud, Ken Lando Higuchi, Chumpinski, Bobby Carmen, Nico Kyle, Tristan Pelton, Chance Burnett, Diana Krause, Raven Hart, 1-800-Nightmare, King Hades F13, Unknown Nobody, Joshua McMeekin, Michael Scarborough, Kazen, this is my real name, no shit, Jason VB Wilson, Infernal One, Little Wolf Gaming, Jimbo the Hutt, Caspian, Jordan Niels, Hades Nephew, Jordan Wayne Deckard, Bradley Lipe, Ann Charon, Acid System, Mike Bullock, Prozac and Pancake Appreciation Society, Brian Arse, Cryptic Nightmares, Brianna Wright, Someone You Love, S-Man, Kiri the Sloth, Thomas Burgett, Liam Newman, Sky Harbor, Caleb Dougal, Nina Smith, Rafael Rodriguez, The Ginger Bros, Aaron Stormcrow, Daniel Polson, and Corey Kenshin. Thank you guys so much for your support on Patreon, like I really can't thank you enough. Uh, and everybody who's down there in the description, thank you guys so much as well. And everybody who's not on either of those tiers, who just have a dollar on Patreon, I, I really, I can't thank you guys, like, for making these these past 10 years incredible this this entire time i've ever spent on youtube on podcasting everything amazing and all of you who are at home listening thank you guys so much for listening i hope you all have a wonderful happy holidays and sweet dreams <laughs>